but tell us about how how this band uh, got, got together and uh, formed. Oddly proportioned. That is funny. It's kind of like a W or something, isn't it? It's it's like two really tall guys, two pretty small guys, you know, and a medium guy. Well, it's funny that you would talk about stature. That was uh, apparently one of the reasons. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself too quick, but, but I was apparently too tall to play in it. That was one problem. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Well, I met uh, that guy standing next to me there. I met him in high school and Neil Turbin, the guy in the middle. And like I said, back then, there weren't a lot of bands. So if you saw some guy with long hair who was interested in like something like Judas Priest or Black Sabbath even, that was a big thing back then. Oh, God, yeah, there we go. You see? About two inches taller, man. That was a big problem. <laughs> um, yeah, well, let's see. Well, we had not got exposed to stuff like Metallica at that point yet. I don't even, I mean, you're talking 81, 82. It was just, the shit I was talking about before, Priest, Maiden, when Anthrax started out, we were doing covers of that stuff, and then we started working the originals in. And then once we moved on past this lineup and got Charlie in the band, things took a more serious turn. But then uh, a year later, I wasn't a part of it anymore, so. That was pretty much uh, by the time the band kind of started getting somewhere and getting signed to Megaforce, that was like maybe another year before um, I was already not doing that anymore. And but, but you, uh, but you guys did that. You did that first record, right? You were on the first record. Yes, I was. I actually uh, wrote most of those riffs. Yeah. Right. Um, for those for those people that are in sort of uh, disbelief at these photos, uh, yes. That is Anthrax. These are a couple of early photos of Anthrax when uh, when when Danny was in the lineup, and uh, of course, though that early these early lineups from left to right. That's that's Dan Spitz on guitar, Scott Ian on guitar, Charlie Benante, uh, the infamous Neil Turbin, and our friend and guest today, Danny Loker on on bass. Um, when you when you left when you when you left when you left, when you were invited to leave the band, what was, did you immediately get it to start nuclear salt? Is that what happened next? Yeah, that was great. Invited to leave. Like, uh, sounds yeah. like you're getting a Hallmark card. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was asked to leave in late January, 84. Uh, the original vocalist at the time, Neil had issues with me and Everybody who knows me be like, why the fuck, how could somebody have issues with you? You're pretty chill. But uh, that says more about him, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, I immediately called up somebody named that you might know named John Connolly. Of course. Was uh, living in Whitestone, Queens, one neighborhood away from me. John had been in a very early version of Anthrax. Is that right? I didn't know that. Yeah, he was. Oh, yeah, uh, here you go. Look, here you go. I heard John Connolly was in Anthrax for a bit. Did Anthrax ever do any shows with him? Interesting. I didn't know that. Um, there might have been a couple of neighborhood shows, but nothing at the point where anybody would have known. We would have just started out then, and we're playing in front of ten people at a local, at you know, with a church basement or something like that. Right. So, yeah, but not with that. You know, anybody would remember except anybody who happened to be around at that time. But uh, yeah, so I knew that uh, John was still hanging around, and was uh, I knew that. He was into the, the fast, heavy stuff because by the time Nuclear Assault started, I had already been, you know, was getting into hardcore and wanted to play something a little more aggressive than what Anthrax was doing at the time anyway. So that kind of worked out for me. Here's, here's, I don't know. Anthrax played my birthday party in 1982 at Metal Joe's in, in Farmingdale? Hmm, interesting. Huh. Farmingdale. That's Farmingdale? Not Long Island? Could be. That's Long Island, but Metal Joe. Oh yeah, Metal Joe's. Metal Joe's. I was thinking Metal Joe from uh, the Old Bridge Militia. Oh boy, that that's sure. So let me let me throw let me put this um, let me put this up here and let me ask you about um, stuff like this. Um, hold on, I, I gotta let me dig this out here because everything sort of went to shit when I lost the power. 
But um, is this the photo I'm looking for? Yes. And where is this other one that I want? This. Okay, here we go. Yes, yes, yes. So here's here's an here's a uh, interesting here's an interesting picture of nuclear assault playing CBGBs. Now, I mean, kind of interesting at that time, right? You you guys play play CBGBs quite a bit, along with bands like Agnostic Front and uh, and bands like that. Here's a flyer from that era as well. It's a CBGB's flyer from 1986, Nuclear Assault, Ludicrous Cancerous Growth at CBGB's. How is it that you guys ended up like playing a lot of gigs at CBGB's? Well, I think that was a case where um, at the time, uh, a lot of people in the hardcore scene for good reason, were a little suspicious of some metal bands crossing over because they thought that they were just exploiting it because it was cool. Whereas people in the hardcore scene in New York, when they would see me and John every Sunday at the hardcore matinees, hanging out, checking out the bands, drinking beers, all that stuff. And uh, so when we had the opportunity to play, it just made sense because we were just another local band that hung out now it's true that anthony and glenn the other guys the guitar player and the drummer didn't really weren't big fans of hardcore per se and uh didn't come out to the shows but it was just more like uh john and danny's band's gonna play so although we also played lamore and played with all the metal shows we were able to play cbs because it wasn't like who the fuck are these guys although right. there were cool bands i mean i remember seeing Possessed and Dark Angel at CB's, but that was more just like a complete metal show that was being booked at a certain venue where we were just playing hardcore matinees because uh, we were just an unofficial part of that just by virtue of being there all the time. And uh, people would say, hey, man, can you get your band to play? It'll be cool. You know, we're doing a kind of show, crossover show. That'll be cool. And we're like, sure. So uh, that's how that happened because I think we were just seen as just dudes who hung out all the time. And like I said not viewed with suspicion, I guess. And and there was a lot of long hair that were viewed with suspicion back then, you know? There were, certainly, and like I said, maybe for good reason. Maybe the hardcore was, like, super cool to some people at the time. Hardcore, though, to be fair, though, is a pretty ideological genre, and you did have some people in the hardcore scene who might have been a little extra judgmental, only to find out that, like, five years ago, they had hair down to their ass, and maybe that's why they were giving us shit because they uh, didn't know how to admit what they once were and were ashamed of it. But I'm not saying anyone in particular. Yeah, but uh, you know, there, it, there was also you know that that, that era there, um, 1986, 85, 86. Things were a little violent down there at CBGBs, and and there's you know all these sort of you know um, folklore tales of you know. Uh, people, you know, long hairs, let's beat up the long hairs and this and that. And I think it's pretty incredible that you managed to navigate that uh, that ocean. But but I, but I do want to ask you also, uh, one thing I think comes into play here is being that you grew up in Queens, uh, Craig Satari from Sick of It All cites you as really, you know, the person that really set him on the, on on his course to, to be a, a bass player. Uh, you were friends with Craig's brother, right? Yeah. Um, Craig's older brother, Scott, and I were in the same grade. We met in a uh, high school orchestra, and we were both, uh, we both played the big stand-up bass and everything. So um, we became friends, and I would go over his house and hang out, and met Craig. And at the same time, we were getting into metal. This would have been, you know, priest, maiden, around that era. So uh, Craig was just a little 11-year-old kid, just, who's this dude, you know? What are you guys listening to? And we became friends, and Scott was interested in playing bass, his brother, but he didn't really have it. You know, just, I don't know what it is with genes or something. Some people have more of an affinity for musical talent, some people not as much. But uh, Craig picked up right up on it. Almost the same thing like I was telling you about where when my sister wanted a piano and then she didn't play it. So I said, fuck it, what's this thing? And almost the same thing happens in the Satari household. And I was instrumental pun intended in uh, helping that along i guess yeah for sure i mean he cites you he cites you as being uh, 
a huge a, a huge influence. But you know, uh, s s somebody just posted this. That's funny how Danny was cool enough to be an SOD, but not Anthrax. Telling. Well, I mean, ironically, yeah. But I think you're, you're not a beautiful guy, bro. Right. You know? <laughs> No, I mean, uh, I think that might have been like, I don't know what management they had at the time then. Perhaps I do, but I won't get into it. Um, but ironically, at the same time, they were kicking up on hardcore where Among the Living had a bunch of fast stuff on it. But yeah. um, there is definitely a thing where, yeah, they might have been a little more concerned with the image than Nuclear Assault ever was. And right. as well as, you know, being cool enough to play an SOD, I think that was more of a case where I got a phone call from Scott in April 1985 because Neil Turbin had been thrown out of Anthrax in September 84 because they'd realized they threw the wrong dude out, but by then it was too late to ask me to come back. They already had Frank, who, by the way, is Charlie's nephew in the band. Right, right. And I was already doing nuclear assault anyway. So just to kind of – Scott and Charlie, I think they realized it would be, still be fun to play in a band with Danny and thus – SOD, you know, just you want to be in our funny little hardcore bands. And I said, okay, sure, why not? If I was a big grudge holder and it would have been, fuck you guys, then uh, I wouldn't have gotten to do that. So, and and uh, here, here's a here's a promo shot of SOD. I mean, SOD, you know, basically started as kind of like a goof, right? Well, yeah. I mean, musically, it was uh, we always took it seriously, but as far as the lyrics and calling your album speak English or die and all that stuff. Um, in case anyone's not clear on that, we were just trying to be as provocative and obnoxious as possible. I mean, uh, there were people on the hardcore scene we felt were like a little too touchy and we just wanted to, you know, twist the knife a little bit just to annoy them. And of course it worked. Well, you know, everybody, <laughs> you know, you're uh, rest in peace, Timmy O'Hannon. Then uh, people like Joel Biafra, who's still annoying to this day. Um, yeah. We're like, what the fuck, man? What are these guys, a bunch of fascists? We're like, nah, man, we were just, we were seeing you guys talking shit about Agnostic Front all the time, and we just took the body rate approach, which was, uh, let's give them something to talk about. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, and people kind of took that ball, people took that ball and ran with it. You know, a lot of people really, really love that band. Did, did SOD ever play CBGBs, or was this just, was this a photo op here? That would have been a photo op, right? Um, hold on, I here's that SOD record. Is, is that true? This is coming in from Lenny from Crazy Eddie. Uh, was that SOD record recorded and mixed in like two days? Four days. Four days. <laughs> yeah, we did all the recording in three days and mixed it in one long day. Up in Ithaca at Pyramid Sound. Oh wow! Right on. And I remember because mixing. Mixing, you know, to this day is a fucking tedious, boring process. So I remember going out and taking a walk, going to some pizza parlor, getting a couple, of, you know, a couple of slices and a few beers, clearing my head, going, all right, now let's go back. And I walked back in and they were mixing Fuck the Middle East. And just having that one 90 minute gap, just having that much distance, coming back and hearing those tones real loud, I remember thinking, holy shit, man, people are going to flip out when they hear this. Just yeah, had a, that much perspective, just coming back in and going, fuck. So, did Craig, did Craig Sitara have anything to do with the first SOD album at all, writing anything? No, but Craig and I had been. The in Crab a, Society North demo, was that have something to do with it? That was SOD, the Crab Society North, because we were in Ithaca, which was north of New York City. But the first right. Crab Society was Craig and me, the Noise for Noise's Sake demo. And that predated. All that stuff like Anal Cunt and all those bands that would do, five, you know, 500 songs on a 7-inch or anything like that. We were basically taking the short New York City Mayhem songs like White Clam Sauce and just making a ah. whole – just doing uh, that for a very long time with primitive instruments and recording technique. And um, that was just fun. Do you, did, you, uh, did you see um, NYC Mayhem play? With, uh, that was Craig and Gordon and, and Tommy Carroll. Did you ever see those kids play? Sure, I Drive him to a fucking show. But Wait, I, I got, I got, I got to pull a picture. Let me pull a picture because it's just, it's just awesome how how young they were. Boom. There you go. Oh, let, God. Let, me, let me get this up. Let me get all this stuff. Let me get all this stuff off the off the screen so we can uh, get a good gander at this. 
you know. These guys, they look like they're 12 years old. <laughs> and that was after Craig cut his hair, yeah. And Tom, <laughs> that is fucking awesome, man, you know. And look at Gordon. Yeah, Gordon's just like, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> For sure, and and the and the great thing is Craig still plays that bass, man. You know, I uh, remember going up to Forty Eighth Street with him, making sure he got something good. Ah, uh, shit! There was a guy named Jose who worked at one of the stores. We got all that hooked up. With. I just don't remember the store, Rudy's, whatever the fuck it was back then. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's classic. That brings back memories. Yeah, this is uh, our friend Howie Abrams checking in. That nighttime NYC Mayhem CBGB show was the best. Dan has a broken leg. Did you have a broken leg or something? I busted my ankle at that show. because Not because I was being fierce in the pit. No, it was much more fucking droll than that. <laughs> Helping them load their shit up on stage. And I brought up a bass drum, and then I jumped – you know, what is it, a one-foot jump to the floor from CB's? But Ooh. a piece of the flooring was uneven. One part was a little lower than the other part, and my foot yeah. lands in it. Just fucking random shit, and it just twisted wrong and uh, busted my ankle. And I had to, you know, hobble the fuck home. Ouch. Listen, CBGB's, many ankle was broken at CBGB's. That, for those that might not know, that dance floor at CBGB's was like – um, a, a sheet of plywood on top of another uneven sheet of plywood, and a, it was like it was all patchworked. It was it, it was dangerous. You twist an ankle on that floor uh, any any time, man. You know. Yeah, but no one's gonna sue Karen, so you know. Yeah. Right. Right. 